Hello, everybody. Welcome to Monday Nights Tuesday. Why? <laughs> I have to rename it. Um, good to see everybody here. Hi, Breaks. Annabelle, the lovely Eve. Always good to see you. Does everybody have plans for Easter? That kind of uh, snuck up fast. Or it didn't. I don't know. I just stocked up on jelly beans today because they're going to be gone soon. And I have to cook. No plans, Eve? Um, aren't your children coming to your house? Or don't you celebrate Easter? I know not everybody does. Anybody's welcome to come up on piano with me. If you'd like. We'll wait a few minutes. I'm hoping Mishu shows up or... Just you and hubby. Oh, Eve. I'm sorry. You don't do holidays. Boy, not a festive group. Well, I'm the chief cook and bottle washer now after my mom passed away. So, actually... We haven't even done Christmas yet, so I have to take the Christmas gifts up. All right. Does anybody want to come? I posted the link. If anybody wants to come up, I'll post it again if I can. There we go. <laughs> Excuse me. Weather's terrible here. Rain, wind. At least that's not that cold. And our snow is almost all melted, so there's that. Where's Bob? I don't know. Is there some wrestling tonight? <laughs> Bob will pop in, probably. He usually does. Um, unless he's plotting something somewhere. I know, that's... Let me see, Eve, what, uh... Oh, I'm going to knock myself off here, probably. It's 42 here. Hey, Bob! Hi, Misha! I was hoping you would show up. Bob, I know everybody gets so excited about Bob. Bob, what's going on in the wrestling world today? Fill us in. Seems like I saw something happening. <laughs> like <Annabelle. laughs> Bob. Yes, Bob and I are a gang now on the YouTube streets. <laughs> I'm watching next right now. Okay. Hi, Lady R. Oh, no. I've been in the hospital most of the day. For you or someone else? I'm sorry, hon. Get better soon. Thanks for popping in. I appreciate it. Bob pops in and then watches the uh, wrestling <laughs> while I talk. I'm just, I'm in the background noise, I guess. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, not next. WWE NXT. Okay. I'll have to bone up on uh, wrestling. I'm sorry, Lady R. I hope you feel better by the weekend. Anyway, what is today? It's Tuesday. Oh, heavens. Hope you feel better before that. 
Hope it's nothing serious. Okay. Let's get started with our cases. Anybody's welcome. I posted the link twice. Why is my chat always uh, gun shy? <laughs> gun shy. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, Melissa Brown. Welcome. Okay. Um, hmm. Did we do this one? No. Okay, case number 30. Woman rejects sturdy chair, chooses spinning stool. I would definitely choose a spinning stool, too. I like to be moving around. Phoenix, Arizona, 1938. This is Crandall v. Owl Drug. Martha Crandall was eating lunch at Owl Drug. She was sitting at the luncheon counter on a stool with a revolving seat. After her meal, she tried to get off the stool, but lost her footing and fell to the floor. Two employees went to help her up. What happened next was disputed. Crandall claimed that the employees let go of her without warning. Owl Drug said the employees lost their grip. Everyone agreed that she fell again. Finally, they sat her back on the stool and called a doctor. The doctor arrived, examined her, and then asked the two employees to help her off the stool to an easier position. Oh, heavens. This time, one employee lost his grip, and as she spun, the second employee also lost his grip. For a third time, she landed in a heap. <laughs> She's a klutz. Later, x-rays showed that she had a broken leg. She claimed, but it was never confirmed that the second fall broke her leg. Crandall sued Owl Drug for a negligent rescue, failing to exercise reasonable care to secure her safety when she was helpless. The store said the employees acted reasonably, but despite their caution, Crandall fell. Does Crandall win? Anybody? Eve? Annabelle? Lady R, um, something to consider. Does it matter that the doctor was unable to confirm which fall broke her leg? Well, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say. I mean, the first fall was totally her fault, right? I will guess no. Annabelle says yes. Panda wins. Eve guesses no. Okay, got one for each side. This is the Supreme Court of Arizona. Cranda loses. Eve, you, you were right. The court determined the owl drug did not breach its duty. The court said that Owl Drug had a duty to give reasonable care to Crandall once it started its rescue. The court said that this was done. <laughs> Employees looked after her, called a doctor, and even called a friend to drive her home. I know Bob's everybody's favorite, except for Brooks and PG. The court rejected Crandall's claim that the employees let go of her without warning. It accepted Owl Drug's version of the events and concluded that Crandall, slipping from their grasp, did not automatically make the rescue negligent. The judges agreed that there was a good chance that the first fall caused the injury. Because the injury could have been her fault, it would not be fair to hold Owl Drug responsible. I know Bob's everybody's fave. Why is that, Bob? Okay. Next case. So far we have Hey! Heather Lynn. Back up bitch channel. You're doing some good digging there. And here I am getting all the blame or credit or whatever you want to say. <laughs> Did you email me? 
Because I didn't, I didn't look this afternoon yet. I kind of have a hot tip I'm chasing down on that. Um, my best friend. I know you two are quite the pair. I haven't. Did you see um, Ro posted, reposted something from a year ago? Um, actually, in the Summer Walls case, I find it mysterious. I see she's starting a third channel now to talk about our survivor stories. That'd be interesting. We can go in there and talk about being harassed. Um, okay, case 31. Students in disabled car flee through the woods. This is Garden State Parkway, New Jersey, 2007. Podius, why, I wonder why they fleed through the woods. Podius v. Mayers, Swanson, and Newell. Uh, after an evening of drinking beer, here we go. That's why they went through the woods. <laughs> Michael Mayers drove Andrew Swanson and Kyle Newell back to Monmouth University where they were all students. It was 2 a.m. and raining. Mayers was... Okay. Okay, Heather Lynn, I'll look at it after this. Mayers was visibly and legally drunk. And he's driving. On the Garden State Parkway, he lost control of his car, hit a motorcyclist, Antonio Padias, and went off the road. Swanson saw the motorcyclist lying in the road and thought he was dead. After arguing for five to ten minutes, the three decided to leave the scene without calling 911. Bad decision, even though all had cell phones. Soon after, Podius was run over by another driver. He died from his injuries. This one is not a good, not a good, I'm cringing here. I know Eva's amazing, isn't she? She is. Okay. Um, after... <sighs> Oh, they left. They left the scene in the car. Okay, after driving a few miles, Mayor's car broke down. Unlucky. Swanson and Newell fled through the woods. Swanson told Mayor's, don't get us involved. We weren't there. The police, however, did find out that they were there, and Podius' estate sued them. It had already settled with Mayor's. The suit against Swanson and Newell was thrown out by the judge who said that they as bystanders had no legal duty to volunteer emergency assistance. The judge also said they did not assist or encourage mayors not to call the police and leave the scene. Podius's estate felt that a jury, not the judge, should determine whether or not they were bystanders, so it appealed. Did Podius' estate get to bring the case to a jury? Okay, consider you have a duty to not actively assist and encourage another to breach their duty. Um, well, it said they argued for five to ten minutes. Did Swanson and Newell encourage mayors to not rescue? I don't think we know that. There is no duty for bystanders to rescue or Swanson and Newell bystanders. Okay, what say you? Were they bystanders? They let him drive drunk. Um, I guess 
I don't know. This is interesting. Remember the the man that saw his. Uh, well, actually, they were young men that saw his friend take the little girl into the bathroom in Las Vegas and rape and kill her. Walked in there and saw it. Walked out. Left. Didn't do anything. He didn't get any charges. Um. They were in the car with him, so should be held accountable. I would think so, too. Yeah, we are going to talk about the Crumbleys, Heather Lynn, after we do the cases. We're going to talk about the Crumbleys and another case um, at the other end of the spectrum. And then we're going to talk about, I don't think we're going to get to San the Santa case, but we're going to talk about um, a case that involved Stand Your Ground, too which I think is really interesting and I'm sure we'll have varying opinions on here. Um, okay. Podias wins, gets to bring the case before the jury. So Melissa, you were right. The Superior Court of New Jersey, oh wait, Swanson and Newell could reasonably be considered not bystanders to have breached their duty to rescue. The Superior Court of New Jersey disagreed with the lower court's decision. It said that it would be reasonable for a jury to determine that Swanson and Newell were not bystanders. They benefited from the ride, and it could be argued that they helped endanger the victim's safety by allowing a visibly drunk person to drive. I agree. Uh, they did accept the ride with a drunk person. Right. Yeah, I think so. The court also thought that a jury could determine that the two actively as assisted and encouraged mayors to illegally leave the scene. The court said that all the young men participated in an orchestrated scheme to avoid detection, not only by taking no action but by affirmatively abandoning the scene, practically guaranteeing his death. That's horrible that they just left him there in the road to get hit. I mean, even if they thought he was dead, I would get out and move an animal to the side of the road. This was a person. The court wrote that a duty of action could be created by the degree of defendant's involvement coupled with the serious peril threatening imminent death to another that might have been avoided with little effort and inconvenience. Yeah, all they had to do was call for help. Of course, there's a drunk guy hitting, hitting someone. If they would have called for help, he would have been the only one in trouble probably. Yeah, I agree, Heather Lynn. Why is that? It's every man for himself. I noticed that at my work, too. It used to be... You guys probably know I worked for UPS for 42 years. You know, we're in a union, Teamster Union. It used to be you y'all stuck together. Y'all covered for each other. Y'all had each other's backs. And now, before I left, it's like every man for himself. It's like, sc screw you. I'm going home. I'm not helping anybody. Or I don't know. It's, uh, I guess, the way kids are brought up nowadays. Hey, Wisconsin Mama. Hi. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Okay. I'm glad to hear Tilly's doing well. She's looking good. And you got to spend some quality time with her, right? So you definitely growing and putting on some weight. That's good news. Did you have your third baby yet? Aren't you expecting a third? Yes, I agree. Things are changing. 
Um, okay, case 32, Game of Catch ends pizza party early. Earlville, Illinois. 1981, Osborne v. Sprouls. 15 8th graders, okay, 8th graders, organized a game of mall ball. What the hell is mall ball? Um, in the large backyard of one of their classmates. Mall ball is like tag with a football. When you pick up the football, you're it and everyone tries to tackle you. When you're tackled, you throw the football up. The next person to catch it becomes it and it's chased. There's no way in hell I'm ca catching the football. <laughs> I sucked at those games. Red Rover, Red Rover. Yeah, they always headed for my arm because they knew I could never hold on. Oh, good. Oh, my God. Wisconsin Mama's got an instant grand, grand family. Congratulations. Um, you may ask why anyone would voluntarily pick up the football. Yes, I am asking that. The answer is simply this, eighth grade boys. Oh my god, really? Kill the carrier. I like that name better than Mall Ball. Kill the carrier. I like that. That's catchy. Um The game ended when the pizza arrived. Of course it would. The boys spread out on the lawn eating and chatting. Victor Sprouls and another boy continued to play catch some distance from where the other boys were eating. Willard Osborne and a friend were hanging out near a table with potato chips. Osborne did notice Sproul playing catch, but had turned away to talk with his friends. A few minutes later, Sproul's ran to catch a bed pass and collided with Osborne, seriously injuring him. Osborne sued Sproul's for negligently playing catch. Does Osborne win? They're in eighth grade. Why would you even think of suing your buddy? Um, okay, consider because Osborne knew the game of catch was happening, is he also negligent for not keeping an eye on the game? Let's see. 15 eighth graders. Okay, so they're just playing catch with the football, right? They're not um, still playing mall ball. Sprouls ran to catch a bad pass and collided with Osborne. Kill the carrier. Okay, so does Asburn win? Oh, congratulations, Heather Lynn. Everybody's having grandbabies. Thank you, Annabelle. I didn't think everybody's going to answer. Does Asburn win? Um, Asburn did win. <laughs> Supreme Court of Illinois, Sprouls had a duty to choose an area that would not endanger bystanders. What the heck? I thought they were <laughs> eighth grade boys. Eighth grade boys. Um, Sprouls had a duty to know where the others were eating and standing and not collide with them. He and his friend were expected to make the small effort to play far enough away so as not to be a hazard. As to whether or not Osborne was also negligent, the court ruled that he was a bystander. Bystanders are different from spectators and do not have a duty to watch out. He was also near the picnic table away from the play area. He did not have a duty to watch the game of catch, keep an eye on sprawls, and protect himself. Well, that's interesting. 
Bystander versus spectator. Okay. Women panics as runaway truck hurdles at her child. This is in Folkestone, England, 1924. Hambrook v. Stokes Brothers. Oh. Look at you guys. Okay, a driver for Stokes Brothers parked the company truck at the top of a hill on a narrow street that was the shape of the letter J. Already, this isn't sounding good. At the top of a hill. Hope he's let his parking break. Um, Mrs. Hambrook had left her children at the bottom of the J. And they had just walked around the corner and up the hill on their way to school. The truck's emergency brake, here we go, was not set properly. How do you not set it properly? You just yank it up. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, Heather Lynn. This isn't sounding good. Um, and the truck rolled backwards down the hill. I've done that. Creening into the buildings on the left and right. Oh, my God. Hamburg heard the runaway truck crashing down the hill and panicked, thinking about what might be happening to her children. In fact, her daughter Mabel had been seriously injured. Yeah, there's not a lot to setting. I've driven trucks. It's just a, a little different from a car. Just a handle that you pull up. Pretty simple. Um, Hambrick never saw the truck hit Mabel, but did see it come to rest in a bakery 20 feet away. Hambrick was never in any danger and felt no fear for her own personal safety. However, the shock that Hambrick suffered while hearing, fearing for her children caused severe internal bleeding two days later. This one is a little complicated. Um, how would that cause severe internal bleeding? Okay. Um, she was pregnant and complications due to blood loss ultimately led to her death 76 days later. I wonder how many children she had. Mr. Hambrook sued Stokes Brothers for the loss of his wife's services. When wives who did not work died, courts would consider the value of their housework, cooking, child care, etc. in a lawsuit. Uh, lack of consortium, which is sex. Did Hamburg win? Um, would a stranger who knew about the children and heard the crash have the same claim. Well, that's interesting, too. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Um, why isn't he suing for the truck hitting his daughter, Mabel, and seriously injuring her? Maybe he thought this was more money. Okay, wait. Stokes. Does Stokes own? No, it's not. Okay, this is just a driver for Stokes Brothers, so it's an employee. Park the company truck. Um, and Mr. Hamburg is suing Stokes Brothers, the company. Um, so we know from previous cases that... The company's responsible for their employees' conduct, right? <gasps> Hi, Lemon Lemon Bittersweet. Not thinking he won if there was witnesses. Oh, yes, Heather Lynn, these are. These are actual real cases. The first set we did was hysterical, and those were just... <laughs> Who was that? Two people that were suing each other back and forth but these are actual cases um hamburg probably won hamburg 
Okay. You are correct, Melissa Brown, again. Um, oh, yeah. We do these on Tuesday. Um, there's going to be quite a few more of them. I have 120 cases here. It's kind of interesting if you're interested in legal. Yep, 1924. If you're interested in uh, negligence case law. Okay, Hamburg wins. Hamburg wins. You can recover if you are present at the accident of a close family member. That's interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Heather, we'll have to call you the honor or Melissa, the honorable Melissa Brown now. <laughs> she is doing great. Okay, you can recover if you are present at the accident of a close family member. Who knew? This was a landmark case that helped form a group of wrongs called negligent infliction of emotional distress. Hmm. I've heard of intentional infliction of emotional distress, but never negligent. Okay, before this case, you could win your suit only if you feared for your own safety. After this case, family members who were present at other family members' accidents could recover for the effects of shock and suffering. <laughs> oh, now you have a staff, Melissa. As public policy, the courts don't want every witness to an accident to be able to sue the person who caused it. However, the law does give this opportunity to family members. It is important to note that in order to receive money from the suit, the injured person has to show damages. If, for example, the person is not sleeping well, but is otherwise able to live normally, then the court may not be able to determine compensation. In other words, the person could win the case but receive no money. Negligent infliction of emotional distress. It's kind of interesting. Oh, yes. Heather Lynn with a gel pen. <laughs> okay. Case 34. Another England one. Investors outraged by negligent audit. Um, 1990, Kaparo V. Dickman and Touche Ross. Well, Touche Ross is a, a famous accounting firm. Um, okay, the English company Fidelity hired an auditor, Touche Ross and Company, to do its annual audit as required by law. Kaparo Industries owned part of Fidelity. After seeing the audit, uh oh. Caparo decided to buy the rest of the company, but the auditor made errors that made Fidelity seem like a healthier company than it actually was. <laughs> Soon, Caparo found out that Fidelity was not healthy and the investment lost money. Caparo sued Fidelity's directors, Stephen and Robert Dickman, for fraud and the auditor for negligence. Caparo claimed that the auditor owed it for the failed investment, which it would not have made, but for the negligent audit. Does Caparo win against Touche, the auditor? Consider what are the public policy implications of this decision? <coughs> Investors. Um, I don't know how he could sue them for fraud because it was an audit. They didn't have any responsibility for that. Okay, the auditor for negligence. Um, hmm. What do you say, Melissa? 
No. <laughs> Eva says no. Does Kapara win against Choose the Auditor? Uh huh. I'm at a loss here. Kaparo claimed that the auditor owed it for the failed investment. Um, I wonder if... Boy. Do you have a duty to do your own research? What do you say there, um, Heather Lynn? <laughs> Did you ever know Brooks her shenanigans? No, Brooks and his shenanigans. Oh, oh no, what trial? Brooks and his shenanigans. Brooks, Brooks. Brooks case parade guy. I don't think I know what case you're talking about, Lady R. I'm going to have to look into it. Look at Melissa go. You can't always predict proper investments. You know, that's a good point. That's a good point. Even if the audit was proper, The company still could have failed. He still could have lost money. However, hmm. <laughs> Daryl Brooks. Daryl Brooks, the parade case. Okay, is that okay? Screenshotting. We can talk about that. Next time I'll look into that. Um, okay, I'll look it up. Thanks. Okay, so where are me, Melissa? Does Kapara win against Tush the Auditor? Melissa undefeated. Kaparo loses. Touche only owed a duty to fidelity, not to every shareholder and potential investor. This decision sets limits on who can sue in cases where negligence causes someone to lose money, but does not cause physical injury or property damage. The court did not want to see every accounting error result in a cascade of lawsuits. So it created a three-part test for negligence cases. <laughs> um, one, the harm must be foreseeable. Two, there must be a proximity between the two parties. Um, three, punishing the negligence must be fair, just, and reasonable. Fidelity hired the auditors, so it has the proximity and could have sued Touche. Well, they're not going to sue because they made out like a bandit, right? Um, Caparo, as an individual shareholder, that's right, because he already owned part of the company, was not considered proximate enough to Touche. So even though Touche was negligent, and the harm was foreseeable, Caparo loses. Okay, so he only had two of the... These are actually, you know, cases that set precedent here that we're going over. The court did say that if an auditor knows that a buyer will see the report and will rely on it for a particular purchase, then that would probably be enough to establish proximity. Well, that's a good point, too. They didn't know that Caparo was going to use that to make his decision. The importance of proximity in our lives is easy to understand. Before buying a used car, for example, 
we hire our own mechanic to inspect it and do not rely on a report from the seller's mechanic. If we buy a house, we don't rely on the owner's home inspection report. We pay for our own. I did think about that. I wondered if he had a duty to do his own investigation. Do your own research. Right, Heather Lynn and Lady R? You know I do that. Every time I hear something, I fact check it. Okay. Case 35, police abandon washed out bridge. Um, this doesn't sound like it's going to end well either. Gavel Bridge, Scotland. 1999. This isn't too old. I think they are. We, we kind of go on a continuum here as we go through the cases. I just find the law fascinating. I always have. I wanted to be a lawyer since I was a little kid. I knew other kids liked pop stars and things. I liked Ashley Bailey and Percy Foreman. That was before Ashley Bailey became a laughing stock, but. <laughs> <laughs> I I idolize lawyers, not pop stars. Okay. Um, heavy rains washed out the gavel bridge over the river Kelvin. I like Stephen King. <laughs> I like a couple of his books. The Stand. I could never get through that one. Um. The one where the lady was handcuffed to the bed. That one was okay. <laughs> Carmen Dandy. <laughs> okay. Dream catcher. You know, I kind of downgraded Stephen King books to my books on tape. I was engaged to a guy in another state for 12 years and so every other weekend made a eight hour round trip. So I didn't want to ruin reading books, the books I liked. So the books on tape were the second tier, which was Stephen King. Sorry. Oh, Misery. Is that the is that the one where the lady is uh, handcuffed to the bed and the guy dies. I thought misery, isn't misery the one with Kathy Bates where she breaks the guy's legs? Yeah, okay. I'm talking about the one where the lady's handcuffed to the bed and then the guy dies and she's left there alone. And she ends up degloving herself to get out, I believe. Okay, so there, that's our true crime for the night. <laughs> An extra of book. Uh oh, I think he missed sneeze. Okay, police abandoned washed out bridge. Heavy rains washed out the gavel bridge over the river Kelvin. At 3 p.m., officers with the Strathclyde Police arrived on the north side of the bridge to block access with cones and barriers. This is kind of like the bridge, the Francis Scott Key Bridge thing. Oh. Who are censoring people? Heather Lynn? Well, we can talk about that when we're done with this. Um, but this is what that reminds me of. Their territory did not extend over the river. So they told their division to send officers to the southern crossing. To warn drivers approaching from the south, they parked their car with the lights flashing and headlights on. So it would be visible to drivers from the south. It was not a perfect solution because their car was on the north side of the bridge. Hello? 
Oh, I have a deathly fear of water. At 4.15 p.m., the, the police drove off before receiving confirmation that the Southern Crossing was safe. A little bit later, a car tried to cross the bridge from the south. There were no coins, cones, or barriers on the south side because the police had left. And there were no flashing lights to the north either. The driver drove into the river. Oh, my God. James Gibson, a passenger, was injured and traumatized. The driver and other passenger died in the swift current and floating debris. Gibson sued John Orr, chief constable of the Strathclyde Police. Does Gibson win? Consider, did the police have a duty to watch the bridge when there was no criminal activity? Um, I, I don't like any bridges at all. Or water. At all. I don't even like drinking water. Okay, did the police have a duty to watch the bridge when there was no criminal activity? Um, I would say, Melissa, where are you? Duty of care. Thank you, Lemon, Lime, and Bittersweet. Duty of care. Um, I would think, did they have a duty to watch the bridge when there was no criminal activity? I would think, I mean, what are they there for? I mean, in a regular accident, like if there was a car accident, the police are there to direct traffic away from it, right? Um, yeah, I would say, okay, no, wait. Gibson was a passenger. It's odd that the two people that died didn't sue. He was injured and traumatized. He sued the chief constable of the Strathclyde police. Does that make a difference? <clears throat> okay. Did you say they claimed it was safe before leaving? Yes. At 3 p.m., officers with the... Oh, no. At 4.15 4 p.m., the police drove off. Oh, no. Before receiving confirmation that the Southern Crossing was safe. Um. So... Yeah, good catch, good catch. Hey, Lindsay, welcome. Welcome to our Leo school. Um, that's a good, that's a good catch too. Officers with the Strathkai police arrived on the north side of the bridge to block access with Con. That's a good catch. Their territory did not extend over the river. So they told their division to send officers to the south crossing. Well, that's kind of interesting. Is it saying that just over the water wasn't part of it? Because it sounds like they did send their own officers to the other side, too. <gasps> oh! Okra! <laughs> Sunshine! Lindsay. All right. Does Gibson win? Um, yes. Gibson wins. The police had a duty to remain until both sides of the bridge could be secured. 
The judge said that an accident like this was foreseeable under these circumstances. I would definitely say that. In Scotland, the law states that the police have a duty to prevent crime, preserve order, and protect life and property. Ensuring the bridge is safe and other traffic duties falls under the duty to protect life and property. The judge did not want to make it acceptable for police to walk away from a hazard. Many public servants, including in Scotland, don't have to be perfect at their job, and there is generally no duty for police and firefighters to do their job without error. However, this case was different. Once the police recognized the danger and took control of the situation by warning drivers of the collapsed bridge, they took on the duty to see the job through. They breached the duty when they left the bridge unattended and without barriers. So they're holding the police to the same standard as like a bystander. Like once you start to help, um, you need to carry through. Once you render aid. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, Carter takes a detour. Was he at work or play? London, England, 1834, Joel V. Morrison. Morrison's servant had taken the horse and cart to run an errand for him, but instead of going directly to his destination, he doubled the length of the journey from five to 10 miles by detouring to the London neighborhood of Shoreditch to see a friend. During the detour, the servant negligently drove the horse and cart into Joel's, into Joel breaking his leg. Joel sued Morrison claiming that the master was responsible for his servant's negligence. Even if the servant was taking a detour, there was no dispute over the servant's negligence. Does Joel win? Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, this is one of my favorite things. This is called a frolic. If you're working for someone and you take a detour to do something for yourself that's not part of your job, that's called a frolic. And so then your employer is not responsible for anything resulting from your frolic. So let's see if I'm right. Anybody else want to want to jump in? Was he at work or play? Would it be different if the servant had used the horse and cart on his day off? I think it would be different. Okay. Ah, I'm wrong. Joel wins. A master is liable for a negligent servant doing his master's business, even if he takes a detour. Ah, okay. Here we go. The court made a famous distinction between a detour and a frolic. If the servant was going on a frolic of his own without being at all on his master's business, the master will not be liable. However, the court thought that the servant's visit to his friend was a detour, not a frolic, because it happened in the middle of the errand. That's interesting. The master is liable for negligence during detours, even if the master would likely disapprove of the detour. Had the servant taken the horse and cart for his personal business, on his day off, he alone would have been responsible for the injury. Well, how the hell is a master going to prevent their servant from doing whatever? He doesn't have any control over that. All right. Continuing on. <laughs> I agree with that one. Um, woman injured while chewing the fat. <laughs> I 
Boston, Massachusetts, 1964. Webster v. Blue Ship Tea Room. I like that name. Priscilla Webster, her aunt, and her sister were lunching at the Blue Ship Tea Room, a quaint restaurant by the wharves of Boston. Webster, a native of New England, ordered fish chowder, a hearty dish made with chunks of fish. Uh-oh. Does anybody think that the chunks of fish are going to be <laughs> part of this? After about three spoonfuls, she felt something stuck in her throat. She went to the hospital and the doctors discovered a fish bone, which they removed. Her injuries from the fish bone were severe and costly. <laughs> you don't like fish chowder? I like New England chowder. Okay, Webster sued the Blue Ship Tea Room for negligently including a fish bone in her fish chowder. At the trial, the Blue Ship Tea Room urged the court to rule against Webster to save our world-renowned fish chowder from degenerating into an insipid broth containing the mere essence of his former stature as a culinary masterpiece. <laughs> what? According to the judges, the bone of contention was this. Was the fish bone a foreign substance that made the fish chowder not fit to be eaten? Does Webster win? I do like New England. Yes, I agree. I do not like Manhattan chowder. I don't like uh, red sauce usually. Um, does it matter that Webster is a native New Englander? Well, that's a good point because she would know, right? A native of New England. She would know that fish have bones. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, oh my goodness. You know, I've eaten things with nuts and got a little part of a bone or something and I eat a lot of olives and occasionally you'll have a little piece of pit I never thought about suing anybody though <laughs> bone of contention was the fish bone a foreign substance that made the fish chowder not fit to be eaten I don't think Webster wins <laughs> Lady R <laughs> I'm already having trouble breathing. Okay, where were we? I say she does not. I'm going to say she does not win. Yay, I'm right. Webster loses. There was no duty to remove bones from New England fish chowder. Thank God. The court spent a lot of time looking at the history of fish chowder in New England. <laughs> this is hilarious. And this was 1964. Let's say that wasn't that long ago, but uh, it was, wasn't it? Okay. Um, none of the recipes it found called for deboned fish. Oh, my God. Really? The judges included a recipe from Daniel Webster, the famous Massachusetts senator. Um, take a cod of 10 pounds, cut into pieces, one and a half pound thick, preserving the whole head. Boil for 25 minutes. Add a quart of boiling milk. This chowder is suitable for a large fishing powder party. In short, bones are expected in fish chowder served in the heart of New England. The court agreed with the Blue Ship Tea Room that this ought to be known to a native New Englander. I agree. The court added a quote from Justice William Howard Taft of Ohio, who went on to become President of the United States and a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in a similar case about oysters. The possible presence of a piece of oyster shell interattached to an oyster is so well known to anyone who eats oysters 
that we can say as a matter of law that one who eats oysters can reasonably anticipate and guard against eating such a piece of shell. Um, yeah, I'm not eating oysters. But whatever. <laughs> you guys are funny. <laughs> or they had Lady R, or they ha were having a pillow fight while they were making the chicken nuggets. <laughs> okay. Um, player sues referee for out of control game. Hi, birdies. Welcome. Oh, I like fried oysters. I don't think I've ever had a fried oyster. However, I do like smoked oysters. No, yes. Smoked oysters. Those are delicious. I don't know about eating something surrounded by mucus. That just doesn't appeal to me. Um, hey, join in, birdies. <gasps> oh, it was his. Hi, hon. Welcome. Okay. Um, Sutton Coldfield, England, 1996. This is pretty recent. Uh, Smolden v. Whitworth and Nolan. Rugby is a game where 30 players hurl themselves around the field to advance a misshapen, air-filled bladder. Really? I thought it was a ball. It's misshapen. I guess they don't know anything about rugby. Um, rugby scrums form when eight players from each team make three rows, then contest the ball. The six front players, three from each team, lock shoulders and heads. Then everyone tries to push the other team backwards. I never heard of anything like this. That's rugby? Oh my goodness. It's dangerous when a scrum collapses and everyone falls in on one another. Referees are trained to strictly enforce rules that require scrums to engage safely and not violently, which causes scrums to collapse. Referees especially have to enforce scrum rules for games where the players are under age 19. Um, which is called U19. One U19 game between Sutton Coldfield and Burton upon Trent was particularly violent. There were headbutts. My cat headbutts me all the time. Two players were ejected for fighting. Scrums engaged violently and collapsed more than 20 times, which is four times more than a normal game. I don't think I've ever seen a rugby game before. Um, the touch judge saw dangerous play in the scrums and warned the referee that somebody would be hurt if he did not control the game. The referee said, I know, but I can't see who's doing it. In the final scrum collapse, the Suff Sutton Coldfield hooker, the hooker plays the most central scrum position and is most at risk for injury, Benjamin Smolden, suffered an injury that ended his rugby career. Smolden sued an imposing player, Thomas Whitworth, for dangerous play. He also sued the referee, Michael Nolan, for not preventing dangerous scrums. Does Smolden win against Whitworth, the opposing player? Does Smolden win against Nolan, the referee? Um, consider, does it matter that the participants are under 19? Um, did Smolden assume the risk of injury? Anybody want to weigh in on this one? It's kind of a... Why don't I know anything about rugby? <laughs> 
Okay, the referee. Um, I don't think he would win against the imposing player because I think he assumed the risk. What do you think? Rugby sounds mean. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like lacrosse. Don't they hit each other with those bats? This thing sounds worse than football. Or hockey. Sounds like hockey. Does Smolden win against Nolan, the referee? Um... Referees are trained to strictly enforce rules that require scrums to engage safely and not violently. Referees especially have to enforce scrum rules for games where the players are under age 19. Okay, so I'd say he wins against the referee, but does not win. Yeah, it sounds like it. Ref one. I'd say that he wins against the referee and loses against the opposing player. So let's see. Yes, I was right. Finally. Smolden loses to Whitworth and wins over Nolan. Nolan breached his duty to enforce the scrum rules created to ensure player safety. Whitworth was not liable because he did not hurt Smolden on purpose or act with reckless disregard for Smolden's safety. The referee, on the other hand, had a duty to enforce the rules to ensure that the scrums were safe. Smolden's injury was foreseeable and made more likely because the referee couldn't control the scrums of less experienced U19 players. The court did not sympathize with Nolan's argument that he could not stop scrum collapses because he could not see who was breaking the rules. He had to find a way to make the game safe. If he could not, then he had a duty to end it. The court accepted that players assumed the risk that they would receive their fair share of knocks, bruises, strains, abrasions, and minor body injuries. However, players did not assume the risk that the referee would neither enforce the rules of the game nor stop the game if he could not control it. Um, no, it doesn't say that, Birdie. The player not get called out. No. It sounds like they didn't even know. They just saw dangerous play, but didn't know who was doing it. Well, that was kind of a complicated one. Now, well, here we go. War ends. City celebrates women hit by flying chair. This one should be interesting. San Francisco, California, 1948. Larson v. St. Francis Hotel. Beulah Larson was happy. It was August 14th, 1945, and Japan had surrendered to the Allies, ending at long last the nightmare of World War II. San Francisco was celebrating, and Larson was enjoying the day. She was walking down Post Street past the St. Francis Hotel when an overstuffed armchair thrown from an unseen hotel window landed on her. Holy crap. Larson sued the St. Francis Hotel. Yeah, I agree. Um, she asked the court to grant her race ipsa loquitur. Latin for the thing speaks for itself. If the court grants her race ipsa loquitur, the burden of proof would shift from her to the hotel. It would now be the hotel's obligation to prove that it was not responsible for the accident. So, yeah, what that does is you don't have to prove that they were negligent. They have to prove that they were not negligent. 
Really, you're all happy that the war ended and you get hit by an armchair. She said that because the sofa came from a room owned and operated by the hotel, the hotel should have to prove that it was not responsible for the accident. The hotel, she said, controlled all the information about what guests and furniture were in what room. So the hotel should re be responsible for proving that it is innocent. The hotel said that race ipsilocator should not be granted just because the hotel owned the building does not mean that it had exclusive control over all the furnishings. Does the court grant Larson race ipsilocator? Consider, is it the hotel's responsibility to make sure that guests can't throw things from windows? Um, I would say no. I would say no. Is that their responsibility? Anybody want to say anything? Melissa? All right. Court of Appeals of California. Yes, and the hotel can sue the guest. Oh, you think it's it is the hotel's responsibility? <laughs> oh my god, what's that movie? I was looking up. I always cry at that. I was looking up. <sighs> okay, Larson loses. Does not get race ipsilocator. The hotel does not have exclusive control of the furniture. Many people could have thrown the armchair. In general, courts will not grant race ipsilocator unless it's crystal clear who is at fault. In this case, the court said that the burden of proof could only shift to St. Francis if St. Francis had exclusive control over the object that caused the injury and the injury would not have happened unless the hotel was negligent. Yeah, I think. Oh, well, it didn't throw itself. <laughs> oh, Eve. We're just trying to figure it out as we go. We'd all be um, appointed judges in real life if we had all the answers. Okay. Um, regarding the second point, the injury could have happened if a guest threw the armchair out of the window. St. Francis can't control the actions of its guests. Therefore, Larson must keep the burden of proof. Theoretically, she could hire investigators to figure out who is in the room with the missing armchair. Practically, she's out of luck. Yeah, that's a good point. She should sue the person that threw the armchair, not the hotel. Don't look up the movie. No, it's, um, what is the name of that movie? Oh, isn't it Cary Grant? Um, remember they're married, they fall in love. Oh, come on, you guys. Yeah, they were celebrating the war being over by throwing a chair out the window. Exactly. Um, well, some sports fans celebrate a win by setting fire to cars. I guess you can't predict uh, people's behavior. Some people just look for an excuse to do something destructive, is my belief, my opinion. No, it's a movie. It's Cary Grant, isn't it? And who's the woman? They fall in love on a cruise ship, but they're both married. So they agree to meet at the Statue of Liberty in a year so he waits she never shows up he said um years later i forget how he finds her 
she's in a wheelchair and she didn't want to burden him. And she said, I was looking up. She was looking up. I am a guy by car. <gasps> no, it's not sleepless in Seattle. <sighs> oh, darn it, you guys. Okay. I'm officially the oldest one here, apparently. Um, case 40. This should be a good one. What? This is the last one today. What shall we do with a drunken sailor? Bartifus, Norway, 1994, Barrett v. Ministry of Defense. It was a cold gray. Yes. Thank you, Melissa. June Allison, was that it? I don't remember who the woman was. Thank you, Melissa. The fair to remember. Yes, that one always makes me cry. Um, it was a cold gray January 22nd at a remote British Royal Navy station in northern Norway. This sounds like the beginning of a um, Snoopy. Didn't he write those things on his typewriter? It was a cold gray night. Something like that. Okay. <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> Walk the plank. <laughs> um... No, you never watched that movie, Eve? Oh, you need to watch that. Do you like old movies? Um, it's, I think it's black and white. Oh, get the Kleenex ready because it's a sad one. And I already spoiled it for you. I spoiled the ending. Okay, we'll forgive you, Lady R. Um... At that time of year, with only four hours of sunlight and well above the Arctic Circle, twilight begins at noon. To relieve the boredom, the station had a game room, a gym, a sauna, and three bars. <laughs> a bar in the game room, a bar in the gym, and a bar in the sauna. It was Naval Airman Terrence Barrett's 30th birthday. He just learned that he was going to be promoted and he was celebrating at the bar that was putting on Hawaiian night. His friends were buying him drinks. He ended up drinking a minimum of four ciders and nine double Bacardis. Holy crap. At 11.30, he became unconscious. I can already see what's going to happen here. It happened to a friend of mine in high school. I can always tell. Oh, Deborah Carr. Deborah Carr, thank you. I can already see what's going to happen. The duty officer took him to his bunk and placed him on his side in the recovery position. He did not call for a medic, but did check on Barrett three times. He was tossing and turning. At 2.30 a.m., his cabin mate returned and saw that he had tragically suffocated to death after vomiting. I could see that coming. His widow sued the Ministry of Defense for negligently failing to enforce rules to prevent drunkenness and or negligent care for him when he passed out. Does Barrett's widow win? Consider, I had to Google the movie. Yeah, that's a good, if I tried to Google it, I'd, I'd kick myself out of my own life. Consider, does a person who drinks too much assume the responsibility that they could die? Yes, I think they do. Who doesn't know that you can die from drinking too much alcohol? Pretty much everybody. How much effort does a person rescuing an intoxicated person have to make? Uh, uh oh. I think it's going to hinge on that. 
His widow sued the Ministry of Defense for negligently failing to enforce rules to prevent drunkenness. Did they have rules to prevent drunkenness? They had three freaking bars. Um, his friends were buying him drinks. Four ciders and nine double Bacardis. I think a person should assume that responsibility, but... Hmm. He did not call for a medic. Does Barrett's widow win? Own your own shit, buddy. Okay, we're just about to find out. Ooh, split decision. Barrett is two-thirds at fault. The Navy failed to care for its unconscious airman. Barrett was at fault for his own drunkenness. Once the duty officer began taking care of Barrett, the Navy became responsible for his survival. It's foreseeable that a drunk person could roll out of the recovery position, vomit, and choke. I agree with that. Therefore, the officer on duty did not take the necessary steps such as getting a medic to make sure he stayed safe. The court also thought the Navy was not negligent in failing to enforce the rules designed to prevent too much drinking. Instead, the court thought it was fair to let Barra assume responsibility for his own drinking. No one is a better place to judge the amount that he can safely consume. To blame one adult for another's lack of self-control is neither just nor reasonable. So Barrett must share responsibility for his own death. The court reduced the money that would have been paid to his widow by two-thirds. Yeah, it is. I, yeah, I had a, a good friend in high school, Larry, who died. His friends dumped him on his back. Um, that took me a long time to get over that. Okay, so that's the end of the cases today. Now, let's do the Crumleys. I know. And we had several people that did not make it to graduation. And they all involved drinking. That I can think of. Okay. Is uh, Heather Lynn still gone? You never heard of the Crumblies? Heather Lynn wanted to talk about the Crumblies. Should we wait until she... gets here? Um, okay, here's another... Uh, we'll wait and see if she comes back for the, before we do the Crumleys and this other case that is at the other end of the spectrum. I think, um, Mishu suggested it, but let's look at this other case. And I think I'm anxious to hear what everybody has to say about this. Um, let me get the names here. Right. Well, where is it? Uh oh. All right, so. Hmm. Okay. So here's a guy, uh, Byron, and he had his house broken into previously. And um, 
the door was kicked in. This is an actual case. Um, the panel of his door was kicked in. He wasn't home. And the whole place was ransacked. All the drawers were pulled out. Things were stolen. Um, I can't remember if it was guns, but I know there's quite a bit of coins. Um, things, I think, worth about $20, $25,000 maybe were missing. And the police didn't really investigate. Um, they had a tread pattern <clears throat> on the panel door. But other than that, they didn't really do much investigating, if any, because there really wasn't anything to go on. Oh, okay. Yep. Probably do. <laughs> it was kind of famous. I remember it vividly. So, look, I was kind of pissed off that his stuff was getting uh, stolen. And that the police didn't do anything about it. So, here's what he did. He went and took his car and drove it down to the end of the road. And then walked back home. Um, he went downstairs. He had two guns. Um, he sat in a chair uh, that was hidden from the stairway by two bookshelves. He had some snacks and a book to read. And um, he took the light bulbs out so that no one could turn on the lights. And um, he sat there and waited. Yeah, that's not that unusual, unfortunately. So, in comes, because the, the people that were robbing the houses, it was... Um, an 18-year-old man and his 19-year-old female cousin. I know her. I remember her name was Haley. <clears throat> so they, uh, the man broke um, a double-paned window with a iron with a metal bar. Climbed in through the window, went down the stairs, and the guy shot him. And then he fell down to the bottom of the stairs and he shot him a few more times. Then he drug the body into the next room and covered it with a tarp. <laughs> and then he went back and sat in his chair. So four minutes later, the girl comes in because she heard the shots. She climbed through the window, went down the stairs. As soon as he saw her legs, shot her. She fell to the bottom of the stairs. He um, shot her six times in total. Um, all the while she's moaning and he moved her body into the other room too on the tarp. And apparently she made a noise at that point. He thought she was still alive. So he shot her once more up under the chin into her brain. Is this not the one you were thinking of, Lady R? So then he waited a day before he called the police. He just kind of hung out. Um, and he had also had two tape recorders set up on top of the bookshelves that taped everything. It taped him before the shootings trying out different stories for his 911 calls. I don't know if it was, Melissa. I don't know. It could have been. It was a pretty famous case. So, why? So then he was charged. So is this murder or is this a case of stand your ground? Did he have a duty to retreat? Was he did reasonable? I'm just really interested what 
what people think because I go back and forth. I still go back and forth. He was found guilty, sentenced to life imprisonment because they decided that it was more premeditated murder than stand your ground. Um, but he was in his own home. They did break in. They were robbing him. But on the other hand, he like set it up, right? And laid in wait. Nobody's got any um, thoughts on this. I thought there'd be a lot of conversation about it. Oh, yeah. So. Here we have the castle doctrine versus stand your ground. So not all states have stand your ground laws. Not all states have castle doctrine either. The castle doctrine allows you to use deadly force against intruders to defend yourself within your own home. In contrast, the stand your ground doctrine allows you to use proportional force to reasonably defend yourself at any location where you have a legal right to be. Both doctrines require no duty to retreat. 27 states have stand your ground laws. 10 have castle doctrine laws and 13 states say you have a duty to retreat. The castle doctrine is often seen as an extension of the concept of the home as a person's sanctuary where they have the right to protect themselves and their loved ones from intruders or threats. By allowing individuals to defend their homes without the duty to retreat, castle laws recognize the importance of personal safety within one's own property. Um... Okay, wait. I think if he would have fired once and reported yes, yes, I, I, that's pretty much what they found. I mean, he shot her six times. They didn't have any weapons. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, I go back and forth, back and forth, and I have for years. I just don't. Yeah, he didn't call the cops for. Um, he didn't call the cops for a day. He said he didn't want to bother them. The fact that he set the tape recorders up and practiced his different stories. Okay, here's, um, let's see. Here's the video recording. And actually, the agent that investigated this, he had to move out of town because of threats and harassment, phone calls, drive-bys. Um, his wife got harassed at work. Eventually, he lost his marriage because of it. It really split the town. Yeah, I think so, too. Oh, yeah, he recorded it. He had two tape recorders, Lady R. Okay, so here's the tape recordings. Um, the Agent Nelson, he's the one that... Um, oh, yeah, and they had surveillance video of them before they entered the house also. Okay, Agent Nelson explained to the jury that you can see Smith exit his front door, enter his vehicle, back it out, and leave at 11.25 a.m. Nelson said when she turned on the DVR recorder, it was time-stamped with the time and day of each video. Smith returned to his home on foot because he walked home 20 minutes later at 11.45. At 12.33, Brady, who was the boy, 
is seen running up the stairs of the deck in the back of the residence. He begins looking in windows and tries a door. About 12.35 p.m., he spots a camera positioned in a wood pile and turns it upside down. On another camera, he can be seen holding his hands over his face. He's seen walking around the front of the house at 12.37 p.m., and he goes around to the back of the house at 12.38. At 12.39, he's seen for the last time on the surveillance video on the upper deck in the back of the house. It's not until 1251 that Kiefer, this is the girl, Haley, can be seen running across the driveway in the front yard to the upper deck. She's carrying a large pink purse and has a cell phone to her ear. She walks out of camera range and walks into the deck. Um, she actually had drugs, um, a couple of dextromethorphan and cannabis and a pretty hefty dose of dextromethorphan. Can't remember if they said that. Oh, Haley. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. How many fenders in her? That's Haley's relatives said that they should have been caught and had consequences and been able to see that they were wrong and change their ways. But they're, you know, 18 and 19, right? They had a lot of stolen goods in their car. So it's like they'd been doing this for quite a while. I don't know. I don't know. I honestly don't. I don't know. Okay, so um Okay, Brady, the boy had three shots. Mill said any one of the three shots to Brady could have been fatal after a certain amount of time, but the gunshot that entered his brain was the first one to cause the death. Um, Haley, was shot six times. She was shot with two different weapons because the first gun jammed, so he switched to the other gun. He said he, he didn't want her to suffer um, unnecessarily, so he wanted to put her out of her misery. Six shots she had. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Exactly. Um, yeah. We have a case here that's divided our town. And when that goes to trial, I will cover it. So far, it's just dragged on to different courts and appeals. Um, a police officer stopped a car, lied about the reason. And uh, the guy got out. And then um, when the policeman walked up there, he ran. So the cop chased him. and. <sighs> it's brutal to watch. It just makes me sick. He's on his back. The guy's on his stomach. The cop is sitting on his back. Um, the guy's grabbing the taser. The cop has deployed the taser twice. So at that point, it's not functioning. And he keeps yelling, let go of it, let go of it. And then he just pulls out his gun, sticks it to the back of the guy's head and kills him. And that's what I say. A, a traffic stop should not result in an execution. And uh, it's pretty brutal. And it's just, I don't know.
They've had a lot of experts on both sides. It's a very interesting legal case. Use of force. I mean, it, why didn't he just... The guy had a friend there in the car with him that videoed it. It was videoed from several different, you know, ring cameras and um, the body cam, which mysteriously came off before the guy was shot. Um, this officer had been reprimanded for excessive use of force previously, but then they kind of covered that up. So here we have a young white Dutch, which is this is a Dutch community here, Christian Forum, cop who shoots a black immigrant with a criminal record. And I'm just shocked at the amount of people in town that are like, well, he shouldn't have run. He shouldn't have run. If he didn't run, he wouldn't have get shot. Ugh. It's a freaking traffic stop. Plus, he was profiled. Here, I'm getting carried away. It's, um... The cop said he used plate reader. Uh, a plate reader. And that was the reason why he stopped him. However, he hadn't been trained to use the plate reader and it wasn't operable in his car. So he lied about that. Um, no, this one I'm talking about. No, the guy that shot the two girls. Yes, he got life and life with no pearl. Um, there are, and you know, it's odd because some guys apply at a force and fail the psychological evaluation and go and get hired somewhere else. Yeah, there are actually in one suburb here, they call them Walker stalkers, the cops, they are nasty. The taser didn't work. Um, I can't remember. I think the taser. No, he did fall to the ground. I know the taser might have hit him once. But the taser was deployed twice before he grabbed it. Plus, there's no way he's going to get. I mean, he's on his stomach on the ground. And the cop is straddling him on his back. The cop really wasn't in danger of being tasered. Plus, the taser wasn't operable at that point. Exactly. It's... Yeah. When it goes to trial, I'll be talking about it, and I'll post the video. The, the video is pretty pretty hard to see I think Heather Lynn has a monopoly on the gel pens you know speaking of not having a pen I think I said this on my post yesterday I came out of one of my um, appointments and somebody had backed into my car so when I called the insurance I she said they didn't leave a note. I said, I guess they didn't have a pen. <laughs> really? Really? I'm kind of upset with myself because I had my, I have a Mustang convertible. Somebody slipped the, the convertible top um, three or four years ago. And I bought a little camera to, um, focus on my car and I didn't set it up yet otherwise I would have seen it the good thing is my insurance said they um waive my deductible and they'll pay for a rental car so just have to get it fixed I guess um <laughs> I was 
was just being funny. Yeah, I heard some noise out there. I should have got up and looked. I should have got up and, and looked to see what was going on. Because that was probably them hitting my car. Um, I was just being sarcastic that they didn't have a pen. For crying out loud, they could have just come up to my apartment and knocked on the door. Um, yeah, the bridge thing. Boy, that just scares the crap out of me. They said that they saved a lot of lives by giving the May Day call and they were able to stop people from the bridge. But boy, when you watch those people driving across the bridge, see, that's my, that's my biggest nightmare. S six vehicles um, underwater that they found by sonar. But they said that the, uh, the people... Most of the people were the men filling potholes on the bridge. Damn, I don't know. That's terrible. I would know. You know, when I was a kid, we'd always go to Florida for two or three weeks over summer vacation or winter. I'm sorry, Christmas. And yeah, we'd go across that Sunshine Skyway. How many miles long is that? And my family, you know, knows I'm absolutely terrified of water and bridges. So I was sleeping and my whole family never said a word that whole entire time because they didn't want to wake me up. <laughs> they didn't want to hear me crying and screaming all the way across that. Yeah, I think it's loss of control. I don't know. You just see bridges swaying in the wind. and I don't know. I've seen too many videos of bridge collapses, I guess. I wouldn't mind if like it was an overpass and I got crushed by concrete. But to drown? No. No, that doesn't appeal to me. <clears throat> Although... Hopefully, they died when in the car when it hit the water rather than drowned. I'm thinking from what I've read. Yeah, we're kind of on a dark subject here, aren't we? Okay, sh should we do the crumblies? Or should we... Uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, on the Mackinac Bridge, they have people that will drive you across. I almost did that once. I actually know a semi-driver who's semi-flipped over on its side on the Mackinac Bridge when it was windy. <sighs> I would have died of a heart attack, I'm sure. <gasps> no way. Did he live? Bob? Was he hurt bad? Okay, here's um Okay. Here's the Crumleys. Um, and <clears throat> Ethan Crumley is uh, a Michigan school shooter. Oh my God. Thank goodness. Oh my God. No, 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 no. Okay, so Ethan Crumley is. Um, a boy that had uh, some mental health problems that happened here in Michigan. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> hey, it's all good. Bob shows his support. I appreciate it. 
So Jennifer James Crumbley's 15-year-old son, Ethan, shot and killed four Oxford High School students and wounded seven others on November 30th, 2021. So he was um, put on trial and uh, convicted. Then they went after his parents. So, <clears throat> and his parents were convicted. So they're saying that his parents should have gotten him mental health help. That, um, and they, his parents actually bought him the gun that he used. Um, so they're saying that they should have gotten him more help. They should have recognized that he was troubled um, and that they were responsible. Yes. But here's the problem. So here's um, a former prosecutor questions if charging parents for child's crimes is just. It says what it means for parents of drug dealers and gang bangers. Um, the conviction of school shooter Ethan Crumley's parents could result in charges against parents who are aware their children are involved in violent gangs or drug dealing. I don't know. So what are you thinking about this? The jury found each Michigan parent guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter, unprecedented rulings in the U.S. Hi, Tree Tree. Welcome. Did you watch it? What did you think? Prosecutors said the Crumley parents who bought a firearm for their son failed to secure the weapon and address their son's mental health. Neither parent was aware of the severity of Ethan's mental health and couldn't help him as a result. James' sister Karen Crumbly and Jennifer argued. Jennifer is the mother. Um, I think the implication of this case going forward is multifaceted, the prosecutor said. It's a case of you had better be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Um, Barrick, this is the a former prosecutor who has prosecuted and tried more than 200 cases over 12 years, including gang related homicides and involuntary manslaughter cases said prosecutors could feel pressured to charge parents in future school shootings. But he added that the crumbly convictions could have broader implications. With the fentanyl crisis, if you could show that a parent knew that their minor child was engaged in trafficking of drugs and someone were to die as a result of that, there could be future prosecution, prosecutions in those types of cases. What do you think, Tree Tree, about um, the implications, the kind of precedent that this sets for other cases? I know they're talking about passing laws um, where, what is, what was that, that if you, no, that doesn't apply. Um, they're talking about parents being made to pay child support if their kid gets someone pregnant. I don't know. How responsible are parents for what their kids do? I think kids... Parents do could let their kids get away with too much. <sighs> but 
But on the other hand, okay, here, I don't know if Mishu's Mich still here, but um, I think it was her that said we should contrast this case where the parents are accused of not doing enough with that of uh, the Ferritures. who lock their um, son in a box in the garage, his adopted son. Um, he actually didn't think they should be. He said they just made a mistake. He didn't think they should be convicted. But he had a bucket for a bathroom. This is pretty extreme. But he had done some terrible things. He'd injured people. Um, you know, sometimes like those parents with uh, adopted kids with um, attachment disorder that are so violent, what do you do? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think they should have done more in that case. But here, this um, boy stealing, lying, hitting. Hacking into the school computer, um, embarrassing his younger sister in class, accidentally pushing his baby brother off a bike, um, see what else, he pushed people, he'd actually injured people. He fantasized about killing people. He was 14. Yes. But, Birdie, the problem with a lot of that is there are not a lot of places that will take violent children. And, you know, they have to worry about the other children in the facility. What do you do with a child who's out of control violent? You know, who's... <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to see with... Uh, um, the boy's sisters were attacked numerous times, a number of which have resulted in serious injuries. In one instance, when he was younger, he pushed someone so hard she fractured her shoulder. The boy got more and more violent and even vulgar. He attacked a female by pushing her face into a marble windowsill. She had to go to the hospital. He tortured animals, yelled in class, the Holocaust was a good thing, and all immigrants are drug dealers. He searched for ways for girls to die on school electronics, stole things, money, money from the collection plate in church. He dropped a heavy wooden door on someone. Um, he threw someone off a bike, causing facial injuries. What do you do? I mean, in one case, you got parents that didn't do enough, and another, you got parents that did too much. But, you know, if they didn't lock him in that room and he injured someone, the parents are going to go to jail. What the hell do you do? I don't know. I'm glad I never had kids. Um,. I agree. I agree totally with that. They should not have bought him the gun. Yep. That's true. I have heard of it, cases where insurance ran out. And, um, yeah, I've heard of a lot of cases of that. Insurance ran out and uh, they had to leave treatment. 
I don't know. It's a problem. I don't know what I would do. What's the um, the girl that the parents thought she was a dwarf? She was an adult dwarf, and they remember they left her because she was violent. Moved to Canada, left her in the room in the uh, apartment or whatever by herself. You hear a lot of that with the overseas adoptions where the orphans were have that attachment disorder and they're very violent. I've heard of them, you know, one even killed a sibling. Can you force minors to be treated for mental health? No, that's a good question. I don't know that. You can't force adults. I don't know. Yeah, I know, Eve. I agree with you. Especially when he had, he was troubled. And they knew that. Yeah, I agree. I think they were. You can. The parents were can, were, um, The parents can force them or the state can force them. That's an interesting topic. I don't know. I didn't. I don't, for both, they have to have an evaluation of necessity. But again, if they're violent, you can't find a place that'll take them. And I know that's a problem, too. I don't know. what. what I don't know what you do. You can't have a violent kid in with a bunch of other kids, you know, that's going to hurt them. On the other hand, you can't have a bunch of violent kids together in a facility for violent kids because that would be a recipe for disaster. Um, look at these kids beating up adults. I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. I think we need some anger management classes in schools. I mean, heck, you got little kids throwing chairs and breaking the teacher's arm and look at that little kindergartner that threw the chair at the teacher and hurt her okay so you're thinking a self-harm right birdie Self-harm or others? Yeah, exactly. You can't get people to change. It's like an addict until they want help. I don't know. I honestly don't know. And this is a, a bigger problem. At what point are, they, are kids irredeemable? Can they be rehabilitated? Are some children born bad? Like the bad seed? Um, I think in rare cases, they are. That's just me, though. Okay, let's look at Candace. Let's look at Candace Wells. Just an example. Do you think that's nature or nurture? Because, look, she's, what, in fourth grade, stabbed her teacher with a pencil? Um, you know, she's beating up kids in elementary school. She just always seemed to be violent, always. She tried to kill her siblings, her mother, 
Um, Huh. Well, this sounds like a deep topic. These are the kind of things I like to discuss. I wish more people were interested in that. Um, I don't know. Candace admits she didn't, wasn't uh, suffered any abuse of any kind in her childhood. And you could say maybe later on, she was exposed to drugs and, you know, violence, but not as a child. She was coddled. Um, no, she, she admitted that that wasn't true. Yeah, she said for a while there, she said that Jim was her stepdad and her evil stepsisters treated her bad. And she took all that back. She admitted that wasn't true. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe fast. I could see that. And, you know, she had some mental impairment. Well, she, she was diagnosed with some. Um, psychiatric issues. So, she, I don't know. That's another interesting case. It seems like she was violent before, I don't know, her mother always babied her. Oh, no. Her mother put her first birdie. I know that her mother, Candy, always babied Candace. And at other points, she actually farmed the other two girls out to relatives. Um, but she always kept Candace by her. Candace is always her favorite. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe she didn't have a grasp on reality at some point. I don't know, but I'm not blaming her. I'm just wondering if, you know, nature versus nurture. So anyway, um, I think that's all for tonight. I don't like to go over two hours. So anyway, thanks everybody for being here. I love these legal nights. And I like getting other people's opinions on things. Um, I think Candace came from a traumatized mother. Traumatized or um Candy had some difficulties. Of her own, which I think affected her greatly. Well, there you are, Annabelle. Good night, Bob in the bushes. Thanks to my mods, who are awesome. Thank you to my chat for always being respectful. I, I never have any trouble. You guys are all awesome. And uh, thanks for everybody's opinions and input. Make me think things. Um, you know, everybody brings a different perspective, and I appreciate that. I love hearing that. So everybody have a good week, and we'll see you Thursday. I'll talk about the Santa case then. And um, I'd like to talk a little about Prayer Garden and how she got involved in Summer's case. And why aren't more people asking that question? They've um, dug up, unearthed every last shred of evidence with anyone else 
that has connected them to this case, but yet nobody's asked why she's involved. Um, I don't know. It's a mystery. Yep. Good night, Rakes. Good night, birdies. Love all you guys. We'll talk to you later. Good night.